You are really going to love this birth story episode with Rachel. Welcome to the All About Pregnancy and Birth podcast. I'm Dr. Nicole Calloway Rankins, a board certified OBGYN who's been in practice for nearly 15 years. I've had the privilege of helping over 1,000 babies into this world, and I'm here to help you be calm, confident, and empowered to have a beautiful pregnancy and birth. Quick note, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Check out the full disclaimer at drnicolerankins.com forward slash disclaimer. Now let's get to it. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. This is episode number 222. Whether this is your first time tuning in or you are a return listener, I'm grateful that you're spending some of your time with me today. In today's episode, we have Rachel. Rachel is mom to Bennett and baby Dean, as well as their dog, Scout. The best thing that happened to Rachel was becoming a mother. She's in the field of education. She loves the work that she does. And her husband, Bobby, is a physician. He is in his third year of his internal medicine residency. So you know they stay super busy. Now, in this episode, you are going to hear how Rachel chose to have an induction. You're going to learn why she did that in the episode. And from the start of her induction to the moment she gave birth was, listen to this, four and a half hours total, including labor and pushing. And it was an unmedicated birth. You're going to hear all of the details about how that unfolded in the episode. And there are just so many other important topics and things that she touches upon in her story. I just, I can't even mention them all. So you are going to find this episode really, really informative and enjoyable. Now, before we get into the episode, are you part of my free Facebook group? It's called All About Pregnancy and Birth, the Inner Circle Community. And it's a great place to connect with other people who are trying to get pregnant, who are pregnant, who are postpartum. You can ask your questions, get feedback learn from other people's experiences. Community is so important during your pregnancy and your postpartum journey. And an online community can really help step in and fill some of those community gaps uh, when it can be hard to find folks around you. So check it out. It's called All About Pregnancy and Birth Inner Circle Community. Search for it on Facebook. Just search for it by my name and it should pop right up. All right, let's get into the episode with Rachel. so much, Rachel, for agreeing to come on to the podcast. I'm really excited to hear your story. Yeah. Thank you so much for allowing me to come. Yeah. So why don't we start off by having you tell us a bit about yourself and your family? Yeah. I'm Rachel. I am married for the last 10 years and I have two babies, one that we're going to talk about her birth story today. She's Mm -hmm. two years and eight months. And then I have a little two month old. So just right out the gates here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I did not realize. See, it's so, so, sometimes it's some time between we, when people submit their stories and then when I go like approve a bunch of them. So yeah. I didn't realize you had another baby since then. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. I actually, yeah. um, I'm a really kind of shy person, so I never thought I would share my birth story. Mm-hmm. And then when I was listening back to all of your podcasts uh-huh. again with uh-huh. this one, right. I started thinking, man, I wish I would have heard some of these things okay. with my first. Right. So right. that made me submit two years right. after I had her. Right. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I guarantee you someone's going to find it helpful. Yeah, I yeah. hope so. Yeah. So why don't you start off by telling us, uh, uh, you know, we always have to talk about the pregnancy and prenatal care to understand what happens with the birth. And for you, I thought it was really interesting because you said that you did a preconception consult appointment. So what made you do that? Yeah, I'm um, definitely a type A person. I'm just someone who likes to prepare and I'm a teacher. So I think sometimes that comes with the personality. Uh (laughs) Um, And so on your, I was listening to your podcast before I got pregnant. Mm-hmm. And either you or someone that you're interviewing talked uh-huh. about a preconception appointment. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because the provider that I was currently seeing, he was awesome, but I just saw him once a year and I knew I didn't want him for my pregnancy. Gotcha. And so 
I started kind of looking around and I heard of someone. And so I thought, well, I'll try out the preconception appointment. Mm -hmm. And so I went and immediately just what you talk about so much, I just had an incredible feeling of Mm. just connection. I felt, I felt heard. I felt respected. um, And, you know, just her sitting and looking me in the eye and talking to me instead of Mm -hmm. like at the computer taking Mm -hmm. notes, Um, just little things like that. I'd never had experienced. And Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, this really feels personal. Right. And so I was so happy that I was able to go do that. And the other thing that was really incredible is that I had been on this medication called spironolactone. I'm not Uh sure if I'm saying it right. Yeah, spironolactone. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I had been on that medication because I'd get cystic acne Uh um, pretty bad right here. And so I'd been on it for years. And I'm sure when I first got on it, they told me to not get pregnant. But that had been like eight years ago. Sure. And so my provider told me that that medication uh, blocks the male hormone. Mm -hmm. And if I have a male, it could make the baby's genitals not form correctly. Yep. And so I just was so, so grateful that I went to that preconception appointment and that you talked about it on your podcast because I would have gotten pregnant and waited, you know, the weeks and weeks and weeks to go in while everything's developing and so that was something that I was really grateful for. And I hope, you know, other women will feel, um, yes. you know, that they can and should have a preconception appointment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. That that's a big deal because it could have been a lot different. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing is I would get cysts on my ovaries quite frequently. I would have to go get them ultrasound. And anyways, they said it could interfere with getting pregnant and things like that. And so she actually told me, I think she could tell that I was like type A. Right. And so she told me to buy these ovulation test strips Uh and just start taking them and tracking my ovulation Mm -hmm. and see kind of where I was at. Right. And then she said, you'll want to have intercourse a day before and the day of Uh your um, ovulation. Uh And I, I don't know if my Education and health wasn't great, but I think probably in America, our, our health it, education. It sucks. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even know that. I didn't mm-hmm. even know when I was supposed to, if I was trying to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. I, I had no idea. All I knew is that you shouldn't get pregnant when you're a teenager. You know, yeah, like, right, I feel right. like that's what they focus on. Right, right, <laughs> Abstinence. right. Exactly. And so I just recommend for anyone that's a planner or is worried about getting pregnant or Mm -hmm. might get stressed by it Mm -hmm. or anyone who just wants to be informed of when do you even ovulate? Like, what does that look like? Those ovulation test strips were so easy Mm -hmm. and it was so cool for me to be like, oh my gosh, I'm ovulating. Like, this is really cool. Right. Right. Um, and I did get pregnant the very first month. And I know it's because I, you were I knew when I ovulated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I yeah. love it. I love it. So then you got pregnant. Did you, I assume you went back to that same person yep. for, for prenatal care. Yes. So what was your pregnancy and prenatal care like? Yeah, she was amazing. I was in, I live in New Mexico now, uh-huh. um, but at the time I lived in Oregon and it was a really small town, only 20,000 people. Oh, wow. And so I've since given birth at a large hospital system, but there, it was so fun because I knew the front receptionist, Cheryl, and I were like on personal terms. Right. And she's like, how have you been feeling? And so that care was so fun to have for your first, just yeah. everyone saying hi and you knew everyone and it was right. really great. Right. It was during COVID. So that okay. was, that was a little bit, um, through some wrenches in it, but sure. everyone was just really, really awesome. And so I did, I love that. I love the size of that practice and nice. it was really personal. Okay. okay. And the hospital I was, I, I was giving birth at was a teaching hospital. Okay. And so my provider always had a med student with her, mm-hmm. but I thought she did just such a great job incorporating them as the team instead of like, this is a med student. They're going to sit in the corner. Are you right. comfortable? Right. Um, she just did a really great job to let them like learn along with me. Right. And that right. was, that was really fun. So I appreciated that. Nice. Nice. Now, was it just her or did she have like, was it a bigger, like how many people were in the doctors were in the practice? There was only about four other, okay. four other OBs. Okay. It's, it was really, okay. really small. Gotcha. Yeah. And did you, did you see the others or did you just see your doctor? No, I only saw my doctor. Okay. Um, which I think 
especially during COVID and everything, it was nice to just be consistent mm-hmm. and develop that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually got to have her in my labor. So it ended up being great, but I can understand why it would be nice to get to know everyone sure. just in case. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And then did you have any issues or problems during your pregnancy? At all? Um, I will say I had two things that I wanted to mention. Um, mm-hmm. One was I didn't realize how awful the first trimester <laughs> you feel. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone says it's morning sickness. It's like 24 seven. Um, yeah, and we should abandon oh, that term cause it's yeah. so like not true. <laughs> I know. I'm like, who coined this yes. man? But I, the only thing I could keep down was carbs and okay. I just ate carbs. Okay. And so I gained 13 pounds the first trimester Okay. and I was terrified because I, know all, you know, I, I know how, what you're not supposed to gain. And mm-hmm. I was just worried. And mm-hmm. my OB was amazing. She was like, you're totally fine. She's like, that's what average, you know, everyone's different. Everyone's right. body's different. And right. so I would just say that too. She like really calmed me down when I was worried about, you know, gaining too much. And mm-hmm. I ended up only gaining 29 the whole pregnancy. And okay. so she just made me feel like everybody's different and maybe your body needs more in the beginning. And you know, you're in survival mode with, (laughs) with this first trimester. So anyways, I just, another testament to like who you, a provider that, you know, helps you feel comfortable. 100%, 100%. And then I know you also had a fall. Yeah. What happened with that? Yeah. We went to the Oregon coast, my husband and I, to just walk along the coastline and I was seven months pregnant and we were, he was actually getting the stuff from the car and I Mm -hmm. was just walking down um, the trail And I slipped and fell on my elbow and my hip. And, you know, being pregnant, that is so terrifying. And I remember like standing up and feeling really stressed. And I did something weird. Instead of going up and telling my husband, I just kind of went down to the beach and just like had a moment to just kind of like calm myself. And luckily everything worked out, but I kind of wish I would have been like, we need to go to the hospital. But I think I was just so terrified. I, I couldn't even say it. So... Once he came down, I, I told him and I, I just felt a lot of shame and guilt that, that that happened. Yeah, it was like a, I just felt like I messed up and I'm right. supposed to protect this baby. And Aww. so we, we went to the hospital. We called. Okay. They told us to come in. Okay. And they they checked and then we were in there for about three hours mm-hmm. and, and everything was, was fine. And same thing when I went to my OB, she said, it looks like everything was fine. I'm sorry that happened. And I kind of started crying. I'm like, I just feel so bad. And Aww. like your reaction, she's like, she's like, you were doing a normal thing. Yeah. You, weren't, you weren't bungee jumping. You weren't doing something crazy. Right, right, right. And that made me feel better. Like, yeah, I was doing just, I was just walking on the beach and right. I fell. So yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that was, that was definitely a scary. Um, okay. Okay. scary moment, gotcha. but it ended up, we, we just had to be checked out for that day. Okay. Good, yeah. good, good. Anything else during your pregnancy other than the, I mean, the first, I shouldn't say the normal, yeah. but it is, it the, is normal. the first <laughs> trimester is all, yeah, it's unfortunately normal that between the nausea and the fatigue yeah. is also something like it's indescribable, yeah. you know, how tired you can be. Was there anything else that happened or was it pretty straightforward? It was really straightforward. I think something that I, I didn't expect to is that I did not love being pregnant ever. Um, and I Same. didn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if women don't talk about it. I didn't feel connected to the baby. I love my babies are like my total world now. Mm-hmm. And I felt that love when I saw them. Mm-hmm. But I I wanted to keep them safe and I wanted to eat right and mm-hmm. do what I needed to. Mm-hmm. But I never felt that like love or connection while yeah. pregnant. Yeah. And I felt kind of bad. Like, I'm like, am I not going to love this baby? You know, am I not like maternal? What's going on? Right. Right. And so I just want everyone to hear that. And I love my babies now. So it's okay if you're not connected. (laughs) Thank you so much for saying that. I think it's something that we don't talk enough about. I personally did also, I just didn't enjoy being pregnant. I liked the kicking. I liked the feeling, the movements and things, but otherwise it was like, you know, in a means to an end. So yeah. thank you for bringing, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's well said. It is, it is a wonderful means to an end. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we say giving birth is like running a marathon, but what about being pregnant and building a multivitamin company from scratch? 
That's the story of Ritual's founder, Kat Schneider. She started Ritual because she couldn't find a prenatal she could trust. When she was researching prenatal vitamins, she found some shady and unnecessary ingredients on the labels. So she made it her mission to completely reinvent the multivitamin and that is how Ritual was started. Now, fostering trust and transparency are really important to Ritual. That's why they have their made traceable mission. From traceable science to traceable sourcing, Ritual outlines why each active and other ingredient is included in each of their formulations and why other nutrients may be excluded. They also share the supplier and location so you can trust what you're putting in your body. They take transparency seriously and back it up with third-party certifications, rigorous testing, and even a peer-reviewed gold standard clinical study. Why settle for a multivitamin you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was built on trust, so you know it's the real deal. Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com forward slash Dr. Nicole to start Ritual or add a Central for Women prenatal to your subscription today. All righty. So what did you do to prepare for your birth? Um, well, your podcast was truly a life changing. I, I knew so little about pregnancy, about my body. And so I listened to, um, I started in 2019. Okay. And so, so I started early. You went all the way back yeah. to the very beginning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just could not wait for every episode. So I listened to every episode. I did dabble with the birth hour and evidence-based birth, uh-huh. but I liked the mix of the birth stories and also the experts coming on that just kind of flowed well with my where I was at. So I love that. I, I read the Mayo Clinic pregnancy book. Mm-hmm. It's week by week. Mm-hmm. And I also got the what to expect book. And that was fun to just um, see what your baby's doing each right. week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I took your birth w- wishes course, which I really, really enjoyed because I just didn't even know how to go about that mm-hmm. or, or how to, to say it. And I thought that I think I'm sure even now I, I did it again with this child, but it's just really nice to to go to a provider in a way that isn't um, confrontational right. or it, it just sets it up nicely for us to be able to have a nice conversation about yeah. it. Yeah. And then the other plug I'll do for the, the birth worsters course is that I knew I wanted to do, you know, skin to skin and I uh-huh. knew I wanted to do delayed core count, you know, those main things. Mm-hmm. But something that really stuck out is instead of asking, do you do skin to skin? Mm -hmm. Do you do to ask, you know, what does that look like? What does skin to skin look like? And that was kind of eye opening to me because if when I asked like, yes, we do it. I'm like, well, what does it look like? And um, so I was really able to like dive right in and say, Mm -hmm. this is what I want it to look like for me. Right. And I never would have done that. I would have just done a checkbox like, oh, good. They do everything that I want. Right. So. Right. Man, Rachel, you're making me feel good yeah, over you here. Should good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should feel good, Dr. Rankin. Truly. Yeah, no, that that I cannot stress enough. That was a really, really good, you know, you can print one off the internet, mm-hmm. but there's so much to it and language that is in the medical field or not loopholes, but things right. in the medical field that yes. you just don't know if you're not in it. Yeah. So I love that. Well, good, good. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. So what are some things that you wanted for your birth? Yeah, I wanted the golden hour, the skin to skin, the delayed mm-hmm. cord clamping. Mm-hmm. I, I actually wanted, I, I wanted unmedicated Okay. for a few reasons. One is I hate needles. Okay. So the thought of an epidural was terrifying to me. Okay. And that's then, actually more common than people think that they they just can't the thought of it is just yeah yeah the thought of a needle going in your back was mm-hmm. just really kind of scary right and then also i didn't know if i take any pain medication i'm not allergic but i just immediately start vomiting okay any any pain medication at all okay i can sometimes get away with like one tylenol with uh-huh. lots of food right. but anything strong it makes me it's so just, sick okay okay so I didn't want to be in labor and like throwing up the whole mm-hmm. time. That makes sense. So um, I wanted that. And then I did take your birth class and I learned how the different pain management um, pieces affect mm-hmm. the baby. Mm-hmm. And so I knew I definitely did not. I just personally didn't want to have medication in my baby. Sure. And so I 
didn't want to have pain meds. Mm -hmm. And then I knew the epidural could cross a little bit into the placenta Mm -hmm. from your Mm -hmm. first course. And so same thing. I learned so much from that. And so based on that course and everything you talked about it, I wanted to try unmedicated, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't completely opposed to getting an epidural if I needed it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And then was there anything that you were like scared of or worried about when it, thinking about birth? Well, yeah, I think birth can be really scary. I, I mm-hmm. was scared. And mm-hmm. so taking your course really calmed my nerves down because to me, knowledge is power. And yeah. so I think it was scary because I'd never seen birth. Mm-hmm. I had you don't even really learn about birth in all, in right. life. Right. <laughs> when do you when do you learn about that? Right. And so, so many of my fears beyond like the needles was completely squashed once I was actually educated on everything about it. So mm-hmm. I I did you know feel empowered and felt like I a lot of my fears went down. Awesome, awesome. I love. And it. then obviously it was COVID. So, uh, you know, that added a whole nother level of, yeah, 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 Mm -hmm. of just, you know, I really think in looking back, I do, I certainly underestimated like the impact I think COVID had on people who were pregnant during that time because it was very isolating and it was also really scary. You didn't, you just didn't know what was going to happen. So, I mean, I'm glad we're out of those times, but my heart goes out to everyone who was pregnant, like to add that extra level of things on top of it was a lot for people. And you were going to appointments by yourself. Like you didn't have the same support system and things. Yeah. Yeah, And it's at the point where you didn't know how it was spread. So you're like wiping down all your groceries, you know, and it's like, yeah, we weren't even wearing masks because we were saving them for the medical, you know? So Yeah. yeah, it was a crazy time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And The last thing that I wanted for my birth, which is very different than what I hear on hardly any podcast, is I actually wanted an induction. Tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely different than um, what I heard and what Uh I thought. Yeah. But my husband was a fourth year medical student. Uh Uh-huh. And so, as you know, but during fourth year, you have to travel to Mm -hmm. do basically... Sort of audition and try to figure out where you want to go. Yeah. So um, we we tried to plan his auditions. We tried to plan pregnancy, but so much is out of your control. Yes. So he was gone the month before I had the baby, and Uh he was gone the month after I had the baby. Okay. And his medical school allowed two days of paternity leave. And so I'm sorry, did you say yeah, two days, two, two days? That's all. It's just isn't I know we've got to get I am. I'm we've got to get to it. <laughs> I'm mortified, like to as a fourth year student, mm-hmm. like by that point, you're kind of at the end, like yeah. you're at the end. You're not even like two days. Yes, two days. That's so embarrassing that we as medical professionals can fix our mouths to say that to someone. You can have two days with your new baby. Yeah, I'm learning in the medical field. They don't follow hardly anything that they preach. (laughs) (laughs) These are facts. Yes. Yeah, they're working like 90 hours a week. Yes, all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. So you had two days. So you're like, Mm -hmm. we have to try and make it so he's here basically yeah yeah i really wanted him here i could only have one person with covid to go in with me Uh huh. and so and my parents lived out of town my mom was flying in but we also were trying to get people to come the month that he was gone to help me sure sure and with covid we were trying not to overlap anyways it was just it was so tricky right so I, uh, number one, I wanted him there and he wanted to be there. Yeah. I mean, it's the birth of your <laughs> first child. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then number two, I felt so out of control with him being gone and mm-hmm. out of control with COVID and mm-hmm. just a lot of like what I would want my birth wishes to be just kind of blown out. Sure. So we decided that if my body looked ready at like 38, then we would book the induction. Okay. And I, I wrote down at my 39 week two day appointment, uh-huh. I was dilated to a four. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you were starting from a great spot. Yeah. And I was 70% effaced at a negative two and I was okay. soft. Okay. So, yeah. You were in a good shape. Very favorable. Yeah. Fa- mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we felt like, okay, this induction is is going to. And if I wasn't there, we weren't going to do it. Okay. Um, okay. But 
but my body felt like it was there. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Did you do anything to try to get your body ready or were you just going with the flow? No, of course I was doing everything. (laughs) 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 Yeah, I I didn't do the oil thing or, you know, but yeah, like my personality, I was curb walking like four miles a day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Got it, got it. Yeah, of course, yeah. (laughs) Tried it all. Right, right, right. So then how did the induction go? So since I was so far along, I didn't have to go the night before. Mm-hmm. So we were able to go in the morning because I didn't need the Foley bulb or anything like that. Right. So we got there in the morning around six and they checked us in and got us going. In my birth plan, I had talked to my doctor that I wanted to break my water before uh-huh. trying Pitocin. Okay. Um, just yeah, I don't, less medication. I yeah. don't know. I just yeah. wanted yeah. to do try that first. It's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. So she yeah. said since I was far enough along, she was happy to try it. Mm-hmm. When I got in there, the nurses were just about to change. So the night nurses, they started to try to do the Pitocin and I shared with them my plan. And they were like, well, this is like policy. This is what we do. Hmm. So my husband and I were kind of like, is this something we want to fight and die on or the doctor's coming in 20 minutes do we just let them put it in and then in 20 minutes the doctor comes in so we just thought that's fine the nurses are going to change she's coming in 20 minutes Mm -hmm. so they got it set up and seven minutes later the doctor came in and turned it off so we kind of weighed it to see if we Mm -hmm. wanted to fight that battle Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the doctor came in and she broke my water at 8 30 and said i'll be back at 12 And if you haven't dilated or progressed, then we'll have a conversation about Pitocin. Okay. And at that time, my new nurse came in and she was like, I heard you're doing unmedicated. Like, we've got this. Mm -hmm. And she really like sat down and talked to me like, how do you how to handle pain? How do you want me to approach it? How do you want me to help you? And that was awesome. And I just wanted to put a little plug there, which you say all the time. But really, if you don't hit it off with your nurse, then it's okay to switch. And yeah. I felt such a difference from the night nurse, which I'm sure they were just like exhausted and their shift was ending and they weren't going to be with me. (laughs) But I felt such a change from them to her. I was like, Mm -hmm. wow, that could change your whole birthing experience. So I know you say it and everyone does, but just feel brave (laughs) to to change that if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so she broke my water at 8.30 a.m. Around 9, I started feeling strong contractions in my back. And so, and only in my back. So the nurse said, let's lay over the ball just in case Uh your baby's sunny side up. You might be having back labor. Mm -hmm. So they had me lay on the ball. And my birth plan was to try the nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. So I was excited to try that. So she put the nitrous oxide on me. I had no idea if I was feeling and it was like helping me or not. But what I did like is that it really helped me focus on my breathing. Gotcha. And that was, you talk about breathing in your birth Mm -hmm. class and like the different breaths you should take. Mm -hmm. And so that, like having that on there, like made me focus on it more, which was really helpful. Gotcha. Um, I later found out that it it was unplugged. So I actually (sighs) didn't try nitrous oxide. (laughs) You were just just breathing regular air. I was just breathing regular air. It's just. Okay. Yeah, I had no idea. I'm like, man, I would be in so much pain if this right, wasn't working. Right, that is amazing to me. Like, yeah, like, there's something you know. We've said it. Before, there's something to the ment- we, You never know what mental things will yeah. get you in the right zone. Yeah, and yeah. I. They told me when I was like going to push deliver. They're like, oh my gosh, this has been unplugged the whole time, and. Uh, but yeah, like when I was breathing it, I thought, oh my goodness, I would be dead if right. I didn't have this nitrous right. oxide. Like, right. I can't imagine it worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I don't know. I guess if you want to do unmedicated, you could try something to help because it really right. did help. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Oh, so contractions just kept kept picking up when they're yeah. On. So um, at nine is when she put me on the ball and got me the nitrous oxide, mm-hmm. and yeah. I had no idea if it had been. Uh, 20 minutes or two mm-hmm. days or mm-hmm. two weeks. I mean, I was like out of body. I, I'd never had a break. Like I never had a moment where I was like, oh, there's another contraction coming. Right. I, I was literally from like nine on uh-huh. just in so much pain. Oh. And the nurse came in at 10 and was like, do you want to try a bath? And I like, all I could say was no. And she said, 
I know you don't want me to ask you, but I can tell you're in a lot of pain. Do you want me to check you? And right. I was like, please. Right. And she checked me and she's like, so this has been, it's 10 a.m. So she broke my water at 8.30 at 10 a.m. She said, you're at a nine. And so um, it was kind of like, oh, thank heavens, because right. I, I'm in so much pain. Right. I so I don't know why, but my body, um, it, yeah, my mom, my grandma, all of them, like, barely made it to the hospital. So I think. Okay. I was going to ask. That, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, my mom okay. kept on saying like, you know, you, you have to get induced. You have to get there. We have fast babies, but I'm like, mom, not on the first. Like, right. Everyone's right. baby takes a long time. Right. You know? Right. And then there you go. <laughs> but, like two hours, yeah. not even two hours later and you're nine. Moms are always right. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. <laughs> Listen to your mothers. Yeah. <laughs> So my mom was right. She and was right. I was at that point. I was like relieved because I I wasn't. A, I you know yeah. I think the breath work and like I said that really helped. But yeah. I just didn't realize like there sure. was no break in between. Sure, sure. So did that help you to say okay I can? Um, yes. Cl- okay. Yes, it was okay. totally like I've got this, and I was able to refocus on my breathing. Mm-hmm. And so she ran out to call the doctor. The doctor was like down the street in clinics they kind of do both in Uh a small place Mm -hmm. um but it was only a two-minute drive at that time I transitioned from a nine to a ten and threw up and my poor husband I remember like I barely lifted my head I mean it's in my hair you're just like you're so just like and you're so humbled by this experience and you're just like wow could this get worse and it does (laughs) because you're pushy (laughs) But my husband was cleaning it up and he started, he started like gagging and threw up. He's like, don't tell that part of the story, Rachel. I'm like, I'm telling the part. Oh, we're going to tell it. We're going to tell it. Yes. So yeah. So he's like cleaning it up and all of a sudden he's puking. I'm just laying there like, oh my gosh. Right. But all of a sudden, I mean, that fetal ejection that you hear people talk Uh about. It was like. It hit. And I was like, I'm like, I'm pushing. And Uh, he goes out there and he's like, she's, she needs to push. I'm like, no, I'm pushing. Right. Like (laughs) not just need to push. I am pushing. Yeah. (laughs) Right. I was scared because my, it went so fast. I thought Uh like, is this baby coming out? Like, I mean, I felt the fetal ejection come. Right. Right. And, um, so they all came in and my doctor was there and everyone came in and they, it did not come, it did not happen fast. I, I pushed for two hours, but I have to oh, say wow. my doctor was there the whole time, like uh-huh. massaging my perineum uh-huh. and like, you know, doing everything and uh-huh. which was really helpful. But I definitely, I would lay down and I would have a break. So that's the first time where like, I wouldn't feel anything. And right. then the push I'd like, okay, I'm pushing. And they just let me push for two hours whenever I felt it and how I wanted to push. Okay. And it was really nice. Everyone cheered me on. Like Uh in the beginning of the two hours, I thought, oh, this baby's coming because they were so excited every time I pushed. And then by the end, I'm like, you guys are just like lying. This baby is not ever coming (laughs) out, you know, because everything was excited for two hours. Uh So and then one last thing I just wanted to say before we have the baby come is just going back to how you talk so much, you know, in the birth course, but also in your podcast about being able to trust your doctor. And I remember Mm -hmm. you saying to ask your doctor what their statistics is on Mm C-sections. And that was really, really scary for me to ask. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I was just so nervous to put someone on the spot like that. Right. And I'm so glad I did her. I can't remember, but it was very low. And I remember thinking when I was pushing for two hours, like had my doctor said, we need it, we need to do a C-section. It's been two hours. I would have 100% 100% been like, you're right. I, I am, I am exhausted. I have pushed. You're 100% right. Of course we need a C-section. Gotcha. And even my husband, he delivered 15 babies on his third year rotation. Mm-hmm. He also was, when I told him that afterwards, he's like, yeah, I thought the same thing. Like when is, when are we headed to C-section? Like, right. This is, and my doctor was just so calm and so like uh, patient. Mm-hmm. She never, we never even got to that point. It was mm-hmm. just, we we're just pushing. So I think like, unless you have a doula, which I couldn't have in COVID and some people can't afford, right? you really, really need to ask that question of your provider. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And to, and to, just so you know, like two hours is not a long, I mean, it's pretty typical for a first baby. So it's not like, uh, I'm glad that your doctor was patient with the process because some folks 
wouldn't have been. Yeah. And it's also hard because we can see the progress yeah. that you can't see necessarily. So yeah. that's why we get excited and we're like, ah, yes, yes, yes. And it's not uncommon for moms to be like, y'all are some lying <laughs> such and such as because we've been doing this, but it's like s- slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it is. And you know, it's funny, you know, talking about not being connected to the baby yet. I remember like you taught us, you know, to think about your happy thoughts and think about like visualizing that. And I remember just like thinking, I just have to get home to my dog. Like mm. I just have, and right. now it's like, oh my gosh, I was thinking about my dog, like my love for my baby, but, um, that got me through. So really do kind of think of those things that uh-huh. can help you get through. Yeah, absolutely. So then you push for two hours yeah. and then what yeah. happened? Yeah. My husband had planned on catching the baby. Uh-huh. Um, and your OB and was okay with that? My OB was excited yep. and okay with it. And mm-hmm. there was a third year med student there and she's okay. like, no, go ahead. Right. <laughs> um, but then when it started to come, I mean, my husband had caught 15 babies right. and then when it's your baby, uh-huh. he got nervous and he's uh-huh. like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> So she came and helped and uh, um, the cord was wrapped around the baby's neck, but she uh, just really took it off fast and mm-hmm. it was, they put the baby straight to my chest and, Aww. you know, just the, it, yeah, you can't even explain yeah. that it is, a, that, that moment is so surreal. All, it just blew my mind that love could even feel that way. Right. Um, right. Let alone right. That quickly. Yeah, so. yeah. 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 And then did you have any tears or anything or have to get stitches? I only tore my labia. Okay. Um, so I had to tore my labia and I did need stitches. And I I was a little bit surprised you're holding your baby and loving it and like pushing out the placenta. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, that still hurts. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the shot for the, you know, but you're so happy. But that was something that I thought like, oh, I forgot that the placenta could yeah. Be some yeah, there is a lot. There is kind of a lot happening. It's like, oh, wait, I have the baby. But like you said, the placenta is coming and then the doctor's like numbing me up. And so it is a lot kind yeah. of happening right away. Yeah. 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 So it was really nice. We got the golden hour. And since it was COVID, um, we didn't have anyone be able to come and take pictures. Mm-hmm. And one of the nurses was so sweet. Since it was a small hospital, there was lots of nurses in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and one just took my phone and took pictures and was like, you can erase them. You can, you know, and it was right. so lovely to look right. back on those. So, oh, that's nice. That was really nice. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. So then, what was the postpartum period like for you? Because I know that that wasn't necessarily easy. Yeah, I had a few things that I wanted to bring up postpartum, mm-hmm. and the biggest one I'll say for last. But um, so my husband left two days after, and my mom. Yeah, that is still so crazy. Yeah. I, I mean. I'm yeah. glad you, you, your mom was able to come, but that, I mean, yeah. he must have felt awful to have to leave two days after his first child was born. Yeah. And you, I mean, I think the connection and the time that you get with the baby, mm-hmm. um, he did drive home and like would be home as he was close enough, but it was too far. So he'd come home like once a week and, you know, get home at like 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. and then spend the one day with the baby because he does get one day off a week and then, right. you know, drive back. And right. yeah, that was that was a bummer for like our little mm-hmm. our, our little family. But then after that, he was done. He, we had stacked his auditions. Okay. Okay. So Got it, it was a hard month. And then he was done for like five months. So okay. well, that good. was lovely. Good. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I remember my mom walking in and just uh, so much relief to have your mom who mm-hmm. knows and understands and yeah. just, I mean, there's things like even if you've never taken care of a newborn, I'm like, oh my gosh, thank heavens <laughs> my mom's here, like <laughs> bathing and being careful with Amber Right. And, right. So, now, was this, was this her first grandbaby or? No, no, okay. she'd had some. So she, she yeah. Was, she came in and she was like, I am ready. She was so ready. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think, you know, this, this is discussed and I think everyone's different, but for me, like t- to have someone to make meals and to have someone do laundry and to have someone, I know some people think, oh, I just, you know, want us. But even to have someone do that part and your husband to just connect with the baby and Mm -hmm. you just take care of yourself, Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea. I, Mm -hmm. I, like, grew up on a farm. I'm, like, I'm a farm girl. I'm tough. I can push through anything. Right, right. And you really can't push through this because you do more harm to your body. Um, you Like, you really do have to take care of yourself or else you'll cause more problems. Yeah. So I just cannot say enough having some type of help mm-hmm. um, 
no matter what it is, a meal service or, yeah. or a family or a friend, someone to help. Yeah. Yeah. Other cultures seem to get that, that, <laughs> you know, in yeah. some cultures, women just like have help. They, they're constantly waited on for, you know, a month after birth. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I agree. Like you help is just so important. Yeah, no matter how tough you think you are. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I think um, this plays into, so I did have hemorrhoids after having the baby, but they, I mean, I remember being like, man, I, my bottom hurts worse than like my vagina, like I'm in pain there. And when I pushed, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Uh But I think I did a little bit too much before my mom came and I got new hemorrhoids and... (sighs) I was in just excruciating pain. They they can be very painful. I had no idea. And um, Mm -hmm. finally, you know, and the other problem is is if you breastfeed, you're literally sitting Mm -hmm. on the hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. Um, Like before my milk came in, my baby nursed for like nine hours. Just, you know, you're just like back Uh, uh, and forth and you're trying to get the milk in. Right. And so my mom's like, you know, just call your doctor and go, go check it out. Right. So I went in and I always have low blood pressure. Like they're always like, do we put you on medication? Do you not? Because my, bl- my blood pressure is low even when I was pregnant. And I went in and my blood pressure was 140 over 76, mm. which was much higher than what it normally is. And I uh-huh. think it was just the pain. I was yeah. just in, I was in so much pain. So right. she checked me and she found out that um, one of the hemorrhoids, the one that was causing most pain, had like gone out so far it attached my perineum uh-huh. and th- where attached the perineum for some reason was causing was me just... so much pain. Right. right. So she got me some lidocaine cream and like to put it on and touch it, I was like in tears, but then it gave me some relief okay. and it gave me enough relief to be able to like make it till they healed. And gotcha. They do heal. <laughs> <laughs> just take some they time. do heal. Yes. But I would just say, you know, I think we're focused on the baby afterwards mm-hmm. and, and, you know, that's feeding the baby and mm-hmm. doing, especially if you do breastfeed, it's so time consuming. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm so glad I went in and I think it's okay to go in before your six weeks. You don't have oh. to wait six weeks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we should check on yeah. people sooner than six weeks, especially after your first baby. Yeah. So I'm glad. You, I'm glad you went in. Yeah. And I don't know, for me, I felt like I shouldn't need it because they have the six week thing. And, Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of in my head. So I needed my mom to be like, no, just, just go in, just call. Right. 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 Yeah. So the, the last part I'll, I'll kind of hit on is at five weeks, um, my husband came home for his one day Mm -hmm. and, um, was playing with the baby and told me, um, did you notice that she, like her left side is bigger than her right side. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right. I, I bathe her every single day. Right. I dress her every day. Right. Like I lotion her down. Right. Her left side's not bigger than her right. And he's like, okay. He's like, well, I just, when I was on my pediatric rotation, they said to check the folds of the baby. And if right. the folds don't match up, then something could be off. And so he left and that night I was looking and, it's true. Her rolls were bigger on her left side. So of course, instead of like calling my husband, I do a deep dive on the internet and you're just learning about all of these genetic diseases Mm -hmm. and these really scary things about what could happen. Right. So I called him and he said, well, send a message to the pediatrician and we love our pediatrician. She's super, she was just amazing. And so I sent it and her MA sent back saying, we see you in three weeks at the two month. We're, I'm sure everything's okay. We'll see you then. Right. Well, those three weeks were excruciating, you know, like waiting and just sure. diving in Google. And yeah. I wish I would have just said, you know what, this is really um, causing me a lot of like stress and yeah, anxiety. So can and, I just come in sooner? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 And once again, it's like, I, I don't know why I just, I'm a rule. So I'm like, okay, well, so mm-hmm. um, we went in and. You know, she went through the whole doctor appointment and was like, she looks great and was headed out. And we said, can you look at her roles? You know, they're not, you know, what we messaged about. And she's like, oh, yeah. So she came back in and immediately the whole mood in the room changed. Mm. And she was like, has this been here since birth? You know, and we're like, yeah, we looked back at pictures and they were. And 
at birth, she had like these marks on the left side of her body. It kind of looked like tiger stripes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they went away after about like 30 hours. And Mm -hmm. so we told the pediatrician that was checking her out and he kind of, he kind of just dismissed us as like, you know, over concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we told her about that. So she said, I'm going to spend my lunchtime reading and I'll call, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. And she called that night and she was actually in tears, a little emotional, and just said, I'm so sorry. I, I can't believe I, I missed this. I can't believe I didn't find this. And so then I was, you know, I am like, well, I appreciate that and very nervous. Right. So she basically said, you know, this could be lymphatic where a lymph node is something going on and it's causing it to be larger or it could be genetic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to send you to an ultrasound to look at the lymphatic piece of it. And I'm also going to refer you to OHSU, which is our children's hospital in Oregon, to do some genetic if it's not. So we went to the ultrasound appointment and she said it's all clear. And so to go to the genetic appointment. Mm-hmm. And so we head up to OHSU at three months, which was pretty amazing. They got us into everything so quickly. I mean, it was just like, it was such a quick turnaround, which I'm okay. so grateful for. Yeah. And we went in and immediately the geneticist comes in and my husband's there and she said, so, and I had done research that if it's genetic, it would be called something called beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. Uh-huh. Which can be pretty severe, you know, sometimes they have the organs on the outside of their body, their, the, their discrepancy can be huge, it can cause it where the heart is, since on the left side, the heart to be enlarged, the organs to be enlarged, um, she can have a tongue enlargement, which she'd have to have surgery after surgery, right. childhood cancers, right. um, and I know I should have understood this. But I didn't. I thought we still had the chance that it wasn't genetic. I thought maybe it could still be something else. But right. obviously, when the lymphatic came back that it wasn't that, then that put us in that category. But I didn't get that. Okay. And this kind of goes on to the road of my last few years, and I've gotten so much better to speak out. But because my husband's in the medical field, they doctors usually talk to him. Uh And I'm in education and I know there's so many acronyms and I, you know, and that's kind of the medical field too. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times they're talking over my head and my husband's totally getting it and I'm not. And in the early, early appointments, I didn't speak up. I Mm -hmm. just was like trying to catch up. So Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. geneticist walks in and says, so it sounds like your daughter has Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. And I'm like, my mind is like, what is going on? And, and so I'm like trying to catch up with everything. And she said, you know, she was very, talking very clinical, very over my head, very medical. Right. And, you know, she lists like, we need an echo, we need blood work, we need ultrasound, you know, all of these things. And I'm just like, leave the appointment, like devastated right. that our daughter has a genetic disorder. Right. And, and trying to like grasp what her life could be like. I'm, I'm like so upset by this and my husband leaves the appointment so relieved (laughs) and he's like he knows so much more than me and and I didn't he's like this is a great genetic disease to have one if you're going to have one he's like you know she grows up he starts saying all these things which is great but I I I was so mad I'm like what do you mean there's no good ones (laughs) right (laughs) what are you talking talking about? about yeah right right and so I wanted to share specifically that part of my story because I think for me, I was so focused on the birth and Mm -hmm. so focused on advocating for myself in the birth Mm -hmm. and advocating for my, for the birth that I wanted, Mm -hmm. which I'm so grateful I was. And I wish I would have taken those skills over to the postpartum period, whether Mm -hmm. it's the hemorrhoids or Mm -hmm. whether your nipples are so blistered and bleeding from breastfeeding or, Mm -hmm. or like this, it was in a, in a moment where everything is so much higher than what I knew. I wish I would have had the courage that I, I did have in my birth to seek up, transfer to postpartum. And I think that part whether your child has a genetic disease or not, or whether mm-hmm. you have, hem- I, there are so many parts of postpartum period that we don't focus on. Yes. You did the birth, the baby's here. Good yeah. job, mom. Yep. And then you're just left. Yeah. And I, 
I wish I would have taken that empowerment that I felt from your course and felt from learning Mm -hmm. into the postpartum. And also with that is doctors know so much, obviously, but there is something about a mother's intuition and just a mother's gut. And I felt that the first time I met my OB, I was Mm -hmm. like, this is my OB. Mm -hmm. I feel it. Mm-hmm. And there are so many times with my baby when she wasn't latching and things weren't going right or with this genetic disease or mm-hmm. so many things since where I feel it and doctors are like, well, da, 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 you know, and so that's the part that I hope people can can move to postpartum because postpartum mm-hmm. moms are kind of forgotten about, I feel like. 100%. Th- thank you so much. Like, this is going to save somebody for sure. I mean, we just, you know, being able to carry that strength and listen to that inner voice is, is just really, really important. So I'm so glad you, you shared that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I'm not someone to share. And I, so many times I'm like, do I cancel this? Do I dare do it? You know, cause <laughs> it's just really out of my comfort zone. But I think if i I learned so much and I did put it into practice. And mm-hmm. if I maybe had heard the story, I would have felt more courageous to every time I felt that to be like, no, it's, it's okay. Yeah. And I might yeah. not have a medical degree, but I do feel this and, yes. and we can work together as a team. And I will say all of my providers have been just extraordinary. So it wasn't adversarial. It wasn't anything yeah, absolutely. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, sure. They were sure. all just incredible with me and with my baby. Yeah. Yeah. And how's your baby now? I guess two years old yeah. now doing now. Yeah, she's two and a half and she ended up, she doesn't have beckwith Weedemann. She has sporadic isolated hemihypertrophy, Okay, which is all new, but she, she hits all of her milestones. She does incredible. She's just, just so sweet and just yeah. perfect. perfect. So yeah. And she has yeah. the perfect mom for her too. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> she's, she's really great. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. then as we wrap up, then what is your one favorite piece of advice that you would give to someone who's having a baby? Yeah, I think that goes over the postpartum period that I felt, which Mm -hmm. is to like in your pregnancy and practice it now is to just be kind to yourself and to give yourself that grace. And you're going to feel it. I felt it when I fell or, you know, you, Mm -hmm. you're hard on yourself. And Mm -hmm. if you think you're hard on yourself before you have kids, you're going to be so much harder on yourself when you have kids. <laughs> yes. So as much as you practice the breathing for your labor, like mm-hmm. practice that kindness to mm-hmm. yourself because mm-hmm. um, having that self-compassion is huge because being a mother, not only does society add so much, but you will add so much pressure and on yourself. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's that's probably my biggest when I hear someone having a baby is like, yeah. just be so kind and, and learn that it's a skill. It's a skill to learn. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. I know that I can say that not only I, but everyone who is hearing this conversation will so appreciate you stepping outside of your comfort zone (laughs) to share your story today. This has been really, really helpful. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and just excited to have had this opportunity. Wasn't that a great episode? I am so grateful that Rachel came on and shared her story. I know we all learned a ton from it. And speaking of which, every time I have a guest on, I do something called Dr. Nicole's Notes, which which are my top takeaways from the conversation. Here are my Dr. Nicole's Notes for my conversation with Rachel. Number one, definitely if you're on medication, it is a great idea to check with your doctor and make sure that it is safe to continue that medication during pregnancy. If they're going to be issues with the medication in pregnancy, it's most often going to cause problems in the first trimester. That's why it's really important for you to know whether or not it's safe to take. And there are a lot of medicines that can be potentially dangerous, like the one that Rachel was taking. And I'm sure that her doctors told her at the time that the medication was was not appropriate for pregnancy. We do a really good job. When I say we, I mean the medical community in general. I think we do a really good job with that particular medication of saying, hey, it's really important that you don't get pregnant. But if at the time you start the medication, you're not really thinking about pregnancy or it's been some time, that's the message that you may have forgotten. So just check in if you're thinking about getting pregnant and make sure it's okay to stay on whatever medication that you're on. 
Okay, number two, weight gain in pregnancy. I got a little something to say about this, okay? So really, the reality is that some people no matter what they do, they're going to gain 40 or 50 pounds in pregnancy. I don't want to discourage anyone, but your body is just going to do what your body's going to do. It it can be really difficult to control how much weight you gain in pregnancy. What is more important is that you focus on nourishing yourself with healthy foods. Okay. That is the thing that you can control. You can absolutely control what you put into your body. You can meet with a nutritionist, just do your best to to make healthy food choices and nourish your body the best way that you can. Don't stress so much over the number on the scale. Now, if you see the number and you know that you haven't been eating great, then yeah, that's something to be mindful of. But just focus on what you can control, which is what you put into your body. Okay, next is you may not connect with your pregnancy. That's totally normal. Rachel didn't entirely connect with her pregnancy, and I'm so glad she mentioned that. I personally did not enjoy being pregnant. The only thing I enjoyed was the kicks and like feeling the movement and things, but like being pregnant, otherwise I didn't really care for it very much. Obviously I love my children and I love my babies, but the actual pregnancy part itself was not for me. So there's definitely a both and where you can both not enjoy physically being pregnant and be incredibly grateful that you are pregnant. All right. So it's okay if you don't necessarily connect with or enjoy being pregnant. And then the last thing I want to say is it is totally okay if you choose labor induction, okay? You can totally choose labor induction if you understand the risk, the benefits, the reasons why. In her particular case, her husband had a very short leave. Her cervix was what's called favorable by a bishop score. So as long as you know what you're getting into, as long as you know that it can be a process, then labor induction is perfectly reasonable choice. Don't let anybody guilt trip you and say, oh, you shouldn't do that. You should wait for things to happen. If you want to do an induction, as long as you are well informed, that is totally within your rights to do so. You can check out episode 183 of the podcast where I talk all about labor induction. That's drnicolerankins.com forward slash episode 183. All right. So there you have it. Do me a solid. Share this podcast with a friend. Sharing is caring and helps me to reach and serve more people, which is just my heart, soul, and passion of this work. And if you can help me do that, I so appreciate it. So share this podcast with a friend. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to me right now. Leave a review in Apple Podcasts. That also helps the show to grow, helps me to reach and serve more folks. Do shoot me a DM on Instagram. Let me know what you think about the show. Let me know if you have ideas for the show. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Nicole rankings my dms are wide open all right so that's it for this episode do come on back next week and remember that you deserve a beautiful pregnancy and birth